Welcome, everybody, to the Build a Vibrant Culture podcast. My name is Nicole Greer, and they call me the Vibrant Coach, and I am here with an another vibrant, amazing, full of light kind of guest. Her name is Megan Cook. Let me tell you all about her. Megan Cook is an accomplished executive with extensive experience in business administration, leadership, and human resources. As co-founder and chief administrative officer of Happy Companies, which I can't even tell you how much I love the name of her company, <laughs> Megan finds joy in helping others build exceptional teams and coaching those around her to excel. She believes that at the heart of every organization is its people and that breaking down barriers through understanding fosters deeper connections, which is ultimately the key to personal and professional growth. Couldn't agree more. Megan thrives on connecting with her team as a self-professed <laughs> data nerd. She, is, she also loves diving into the numbers and spreadsheets uh, because there's truth in those numbers. In her role, <laughs> Megan oversees critical functions such as HR, finance, and administration, administrative operations at Happy Companies, ensuring that companies' backbone remain, remains strong and agile. She also collaborates closely with the Happy Science team on the Happy Assessment and Happy Work Styles which aim to understand and improve workplace behaviors and dynamics. Megan works with the team to ensure that the behavioral science behind the happy assessment is robust, sound, and effective. Her goal in life is to ignite passion in everyone, helping them feel understood and empowered and to be their best selves, what I would call letting people shine. Yeah. Through her work at Happy Companies, Megan remains committed to pushing the boundaries of how teams can communicate, collaborate, and work more effectively together. Please welcome to the show the co-founder of Happy Companies, Megan. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing great. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, we're so glad to have you. And I think that the work you and I do is so aligned. We think that uh, vibrant and happy are synonymous. So we are yes. in great shape. I think I have my, <laughs> you know, my, maybe my sister from another mother, a much, yes. younger, a much younger sister, but nonetheless. So I am so glad you're here. And so the first question I always ask kind of out of the gate, I'm collecting definitions of leadership. Just tell me a little bit about your thoughts about leadership. So for me, leadership comes from a very service-minded place. I have a, a strong connection to servant leadership. And so my definition of leadership is really like meeting people where they need us to be. Um, and so I think part of the importance of leadership, right, to be really effective leader is this idea of being able to motivate and get people and inspire them to do the things that we need them to do. And that could be on a football field that could be in a classroom and that could be in a business and organization. Um, and uh, I think part of the challenge that comes with that really is that um, oftentimes people feel like, oh, you're just trying to get me to do something. There's like almost like a manipulation there and it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like a, a coming from a place of, um, you know, engaged leadership. And so really like for for my focus on leadership, it comes about being very people-centric, understanding your team, understanding the needs that they have and putting those, you know, primary and center into the business and the organization from every aspect of strategy. And again, just like really intentionally meeting others where they need us to be in the moment. Yeah, I love what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, uh, that old saying uh, that, that, you know, like people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I yes. Mean, you know, it's kind of that thing, right? Like, I love you know, that yeah. quote, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, we, we know that you're the boss and everything. You're the leader. But like, do you emote this feel of caring? And that, I mean, really, mm -hmm. that's what it is. That emotion, that emoting of emotion of care is a difference uh, between the manipulation and the servant leadership yeah. piece. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, I love, I love your answer. Okay. Everybody write that down. And uh, <laughs> hey, if you, want, if you want a good classic read, go get Robert Greenleaf's book, Servant Leadership. Pull that thing yeah. out. Give it a read. <laughs> that should be on your bookshelf, all you leaders out there. Well, I'm curious about you. Can you tell us about your journey in the field of human resources? I've got a lot of human resource folks that listen to this podcast. And what inspired your focus on people leadership and organizational culture? I would say that's a shift that probably happened in the last, uh, you know, seven to 10 years, really. Um, I think 
initially my career started the way a lot of people in HR's career starts and administrative careers where I, I was very compliant minded and mm-hmm. I was all about, I can make the most detailed process and I'm going to be able to track, you know, every deliverable in the most effective way. And um, I, and that's not to take away the importance of compliance. I think that that's a really important aspect of human resources. I think um, it's definitely something that, you know, it continues to be, um, you know, centered to kind of the foundation of HR. But what was, what I started to realize is that at the end of the day, you know, people are in every organization and, it, and understanding people, understanding diverse work teams, understanding how to build strong teams and connection solved, you know, almost every problem that could possibly come up when, it, when you're looking to really build a healthy organization and a strong and vibrant culture, right? So, so many of these challenges that organizations come into on a day-to-day basis, if you, if you break it down, they're people problems. And so focusing on people leadership and putting that people center um, to your strategic objectives, putting it to the center of, you know, everything that you're doing on a day-to-day basis as a leader and as a team suddenly begins to open up a whole new world in terms of understanding and relationships and the ability to, you know, engage with your team in, in a different way. And so I, I think that that was part of that journey for me was having to push myself. I, um, you know, if you're, if anybody is familiar with happy, it, the assessment that we spoke about that you mentioned earlier, um, the happy assessment, it's rooted in DISC, which is another really well-known, um, mm-hmm. assessment and, um, you know, you have all the, yeah. So I, I'm a, I, that was one of the uh, turning points for me was I, um, James, my co-founder, I came on board at a different company that we worked at together. And um, he had me take a DISC assessment and really started to like dive into, you know, helping me kind of understand myself. I uh, had a lot of goals that I wanted to accomplish and realized that I had to be able to kind of get uncomfortable (laughs) with some of the things that um, might have been my natural approach and getting to push myself outside of that natural approach. And to be able to do that, I had to understand my team better. I had to understand the people I was working with. I had to understand myself and the impact that I had on them to be able to kind of understand that. And so that's the root of kind of pushing me into that um, mind space is as James and I were developing happy companies, we really were thinking, you know, how can we just help people understand each other? How can, it's been so beneficial to us. We felt like it really was a game changer in terms of our ability to build relationships with each other and strong teams. And so that's great, but we felt a real passion for being able to bring that to every organization and um, help everybody's, you know, work relationships become healthier, stronger, improve communication, and then being able to kind of see at the end of that, there's also really amazing business outcomes, you know, that can be attached to that process. Um, so it was a, it, it started with a journey of self-reflection first and foremost, and then understanding, uh, you know, how transformative that was, and then really building a desire and a passion to help create that experience for other people and other teams. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And and so uh, one of the things that I, I truly believe in is self-reflection, like Megan is talking about. So um, I don't know what y'all do every single morning when you get up out of bed, but <laughs> I spend the first hour of every day sitting in a chair uh, thinking about how did yesterday go and what do I want to have happen today? And I think that that's huge. And then also um, this idea of stopping and saying, you know, what's my personality? Right. Mm-hmm. And so yes. that's what yeah. your assessment does is do I have my story right? Yeah. So it is very uh, similar in, in some ways in terms of the foundation of it to a DISC assessment. It's, and I say this coming from a place of being essentially assessment agnostic. <laughs> of course, I, I, you know, I feel really passionately about happy assessment. Um, but we also understand that there's a lot of different um, types of assessments that are out there. Um, but what we think that happy is doing that's really powerful is taking that and putting it into a platform that kind of like drives it down to every member of your organization and makes it really accessible. So it's exactly that. You go through the process. It's a very quick process. You get um, a work style that everybody within your company has access to. 
And then really the like the big game changer is this idea of, you know, now within Happy, the system understands me, it understands you, and it can provide personalized coaching to both of us based off of our different work styles. And that's kind of that foundation again of really like how do we better understand each other? So if I'm going into a meeting and I'm and I know I'm going into a meeting with somebody that has a, a fairly different style than me, maybe I'm a very data centric person. I ask a lot of questions, which sometimes can uh, annoy people <laughs> because they want to just like move forward and get I, I think and it's move powerful. It along. <laughs> um, and I like to drive into like every little detail. But there's you know other work styles out there that what they need from me in that moment is to put the questions to the side to enjoy the moment of, um, you know, creativity and innovation and not start to like break down the process yet. Let's just have an opportunity Let's dream it up first. to dream. And that, yeah. it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so it helped me learn, like, don't go in and rain on someone's parade right away. Right. Like let's then like, there are different things that people need. Not that that was ever my intention I you know it was never of course an intention not. yeah but there's this difference between you know our perception and other people's perception of our behaviors and so the ability to kind of go in and have that understanding and that preparation um has been really powerful and I think that that's um you know ultimately what we're trying to do you hit it on the head it's a it's a tool to help teams better understand each other Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's this old adage, everybody listening, you probably know this one, but there's this, this saying that goes, do unto others, um, you know, as they would like to be done unto. Right. Um, And I think that's huge. It's the platinum role. You know, there's do unto others as you would like to be done unto that that one. But I I like this one uh, as well. I think they're both good, but do unto others as they would like to be done unto. So, yeah, it's amazing that you mentioned that because really that was one of the very first lessons that I learned all those years ago when I took that first assessment and I was going through this self-reflective process. And at the time, that was that platinum rule was something that the leadership coach that we were working with, you know, really helped me understand is it's like you can't go into a conversation and approach it the way that you would want the part the other party to you know deal with you. You have to approach it in a way that's going to be effective to communicating with them. Because ultimately, if you can't get the message across, then then that's on the communicator, right? So we have to make adjustments and we have to shift and we have to adapt in order to be able to like hear to put the message out in a way that they're going to be able to receive, you know, as it's intended. And I thought that was such a powerful lesson of just kind of that paradigm shift of, oh, wow, okay, you know, I need to really look at this from a different perspective. And, um, and that was, that was exactly that quote was one of the things that really like kind of propelled my thinking forward in how to, to work on building these better, stronger relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you said you were, uh, assessment agnostic and I am just like the gospel of assessments, um, <laughs> which, you know, I just, I love them. I'm certified in so many of them because yeah. the way I look at them is that, um, you know, they, they're just different mirrors. Like you're going to the circus and there's all these fun house mirrors or the carnival. And there's all these, you know, the one that makes you look a little wider, one that makes you look tall and skinny, yeah. one makes your face look weird. Um, you know, assessments won't make, look, make you look taller, skinnier, fatter, <laughs> or weird. But that what they will do is help you go, oh, is do I do that? Yes. Is, yeah. Is that, is that sometimes the experience of me? So, you know, Megan, one of my favorite questions I ask clients is, what is it like to experience you? And most oh, times they're like, great question. isn't Love that a that. powerful question? That's so powerful. Uh, so yeah. put that in your put that gonna in be your writing that question down. pocket. Yeah, <laughs> put that in your question pocket. <laughs> but it's like people say to me all the time, like, oh, I never really thought about that. And I'm like, well, it's high time you did. Because, yeah, that's a great you know, lesson. Yeah. the experience of you is going to be, you know, I love what you said. It's on the communicator, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So either you're helping this situation or you're hurting it. I mean, that's yeah. just how it is. And so just help. Be a helper. Yeah. Back servant leadership, <laughs> you know, is what Megan's favorite thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I love your journey so far. Okay. So you've been a strong advocate from shifting HR from compliance centric. So just pause. Because mm-hmm. you you tapped around it, you talked about it a little bit, but compliance centric. So I have this thing where I'm talking to HR people. We have to stop being the principal's office. 
Is that yes. what you mean? That's what 100%. I mean. When I say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. It's like people are like, I gotta go to HR, and like they fear it, and, and they, they're like, and it's scary. Yeah. I do. No, it's terrible. It's in my career where I would be like, hey, can I have a meeting with you? And you see someone's face drop. And they're right. like, oh, no, I don't, you know, what, what is it about suddenly like that? And that's, that's not, you know, that, that's not really the, the purpose of HR in, when we're really hey, like, no. util, you know, utilizing it in, in its best sense. And that's not HR in a company that has a strong, happy, vibrant culture, right? Because mm -hmm. they're meant to be, um, you know, in a position to represent and advocate and all of these powerful things. And um, I think oftentimes we kind of get stuck in this box where it's like it, we become a roadblock, you know, and I and I ha have been guilty of that. Not again, not to take away there. Of course, there's so many things that are in place because they are really important to workplaces. And there's parts of HR and that compliance side of it that that have to happen. What's amazing 100%. now is there's so many cool tools that allow us to kind of automate some of those processes in certain ways. And so we can put a little bit more focus on the people within the organization. But I think just be very intentional about making sure that, you know, we're shifting and so that that's not solely the, the, the box that we are in or the place that we're operating from. Because we want the workplace to be compliant. But we also want our employees to feel motivated and engaged and excited to be there and connected to a mission and connected to a vision. And so there's a, a lot of other aspects of, you know, how you can build an organization and really focus on that engagement and culture part of it um, that are powerful and really important to having like driving true organizational success. And I, I think that's a big component of it. Yeah, I totally agree. So uh, th this idea of shifting from being compliance principal's office to like maybe even having fun when you visit yeah. HR. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah. so I, I think that that's an important thing. And I just want to share a quick story. I know a HR director, her name is Ruth. And whenever you go to her HR uh, office, she's got like this wheel, carnival wheel, and you spin it and it lands on Milky Way or whatever, and you get the Milky Way or, you know, she's just, she's got something fun going on in yes. her office all the time. Yeah. She bought this popcorn machine and like everybody knows that she pops popcorn like in the afternoon at two o'clock. So <laughs> zip by and get a bag of fresh popcorn, you know, and it's just little things like that, that, um, you know, kind of shift it. And then just, just being friendly, I think yeah. is a big thing. All my HR friends smile at people. Yeah. Yeah. What Ruth is doing is she's building an opportunity for connection and she's That's building right. an opportunity for trust, right? So it's, it's as simple as popcorn. And, but really what you're doing is you're having an opportunity to engage with the team and to create a space where now they feel comfortable to approach. They feel like they're working in a place where it's safe to go to you know, whoever, whomever the HR director is and, and have those conversations. And so some of those things, you know, are, are so simple, but it's, you know, you're able to kind of create those connections with the team and, and really like so powerful because now it's breaking down that barrier between, you know, different types of teams. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So fantastic. So in your experience, what are some of the key elements that contribute to like a happy, vibrant organizational culture? And how how can we address these? Like, so I've got HR people going, okay, order the popcorn machine, get the spin <laughs> yeah. wheel, get some happy assessments cooking around here. You got three things to do already, people. All right. So, so how would you, uh, what key elements would you kind of put to work? You know, I think a lot of that is some of the things that we've touched on before, but that trust building, right? So creating yeah. that trust within your team. Um, it's very central to a lot of the other things that you need in order to be effective. So to have good communication, you need to have trust, right? In order to have good collaboration, you need to have trust. And in order to build that trust, again, we really need to be able to, to best understand each other. So I feel that vibrant, happy cultures are built on that, like trust, that communication, clarity. I think clarity is a really important thing. So finding ways to explain the mission or the goals or the expectations in a way that 
fits the person that you're speaking to. So kind of going back to that, like, how am I communicating this to the per to this individual? Am I doing it in a way where they're able to like really hear and absorb it? Because um, we're, we're not on the same page, we're not going to be working effectively together. And if we're not working effectively together, it just doesn't feel good. <laughs> it doesn't feel, um, you know, like the type of place that we want to be every day. And so that's part of what we're trying to help establish. And with this, you know, AI enhanced coaching tool that we've created is this ability to kind of support this continuous learning and relationship building that we feel are really like the foundation of that thriving culture. Mm, that's fantastic. All right. So here are the things we need to work on trust, communication, clarity, and making people feel good. So I, I just want to throw this out here to enhance what mm -hmm. um, Megan is saying. So back in the day, 2007, I took a coaching course, got a certificate and it's such a simple concept, but I don't think leaders often think about it, but all day long, people are somewhere on this thing that I was taught is called the feeling scale. And so, I mean, one minute I'm happy, the next minute I'm angry, the next minute I'm frustrated, the next minute I'm happy again. So, you know, they, you're going up and down all mm -hmm. the time, right? You know, on this feeling scale. Um, but I think that that thing of servant leadership that Megan mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, um, and then just kind of like Ruth's example that I shared a minute ago, is about, you know, leave people better than you found them. Yeah. You know, yeah. so so take them up the feeling scale. So just just as a little um, uh, moment here of teaching, uh, draw an arrow that's going up and down. There's a carrot on the top and a carrot on the bottom. The carrot on the top, uh, the top feeling I've ever heard. You know, like I, if you've got a better one, Megan, shout it out. But like <laughs> euphoria. Oh, that's euphoria. a good one. Yeah. That's like the best feeling word yeah. I've ever found. Okay. And then the the bottom word is not a joke. Megan and I, as HR professionals, will tell you um, it's suicidal. And that's not, that's the real deal. There's a lot of that yeah. going on. Okay. And the joke is, you know, how do people, you, you greet them at work. What do they say? How are you doing? I'm fine. And I think yep. fine is closer to suicidal than it is to you. I agree. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't have to have popcorn. You don't have to have a spinny wheel, but you can have like a smile and you can have this thing where like you're checking in on people. And yes. when, when Meaning people say, how do I build trust? Yeah. yeah. It's like, just check in on people. So I like mm -hmm. today I have a, a coworker. Her name is Jennifer. And she went to one of our job sites this morning. And it's, like I said, the, there's a hurricane coming through North Carolina, everybody. And I just texted her and I said, you good? You safe? You all right? And she's like, good, good, good. I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. it's, that's as simple as that, right? Yeah. And then at a leadership perspective, helping really to like push that messaging down to the, to throughout the entire organization, right? So right. It's, it's not just coming from like HR leadership perspective, but are our managers having these meaningful conversations? Well, yes. How often are we checking in? And, you know, is your one-on-one -on -one just a checklist of your tasks? Or are you asking people, how are you feeling? Do you feel supported? Is there is there things that you need from me? And, you know, more and more what I've kind of discovered is that there's a lot of organizations that have the very best of intentions when they're promoting up, but they're they're not necessarily going through the process of truly uh, training and providing guidance to new managers on how to deal with a team because it's more the responsibility of a manager it really is a little bit more than just hey make sure that this project gets done you have humans now that that's you know, right collectively report to you and 100%. there's feelings and emotions that are attached to that and so you know, helping to kind of uh, drive that messaging down throughout the organization's leadership and management to make it more effective at scale, I think is is really important as well. Yeah. And so um, just a simple, shameless shout out. One of the things uh, that we do at Build a Vibrant Culture is we have this class and it's called Employee Performance Management, which is a key HR thing. But we're not teaching our managers, to Megan's point. And it's a whole class about how do I have a one on one? Yes. Because yeah. we're like, have one on ones. And everybody's like, okay. Okay. And we'll do it differently. <laughs> there's not, I mean, yes. Yeah. I, I completely agree. There's, it can be very unstructured and there's not necessarily a purpose. And, and maybe it's just very focused in one area, but dealing right. with human beings and dealing with a team of people is, you have to be able to have a dynamic approach. And I think that that is a place that I, I'm, you know, I'm really seeing that if we can, 
start to tap into that and help companies understand how powerful it is to to really get your managers to engage with their teams effectively. Um, you know, the, how that will directly tie towards those business outcomes that we, you know, we often see the the business leadership that's so focused on. Those business outcomes come from the way that people behave, right? The actions that people take. So all 100%. of the business outcomes are attached to the to the people. So focusing on that is going to um, essentially drive those business outcomes in a, in a stronger way. Okay, so everybody write that down. All business outcomes are. Say it again. Well, now I can't. <laughs> I relate it. Oh, this is how it Yeah. Re- I relate it. The actions and behaviors of people. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> that is totally tweetable and Instagrammable. <laughs> Everybody write that down. Okay. And you know, what, one thing I always say, Megan, is like, you know, I'll talk to leaders and I'm like, okay, yeah, process, procedure, widgets, production, sales, whatever. But like if everybody in your company got picked up by aliens today, nothing's going to happen. I mean- you yeah. have to have the humans here. Yeah. To the world. Yes. Yes. That's agreed. right. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, and so here's the thing. Don't promote people to pe- people managers if they don't like people. That's what. I could not agree more. Yeah. I think okay. that that's a shift that needs to kind of change a little bit in some of the um, thinking that we have is there's this idea that like, that's always the end goal. And that's not always what's best for the team or best for the individual. And so, What's more powerful is finding ways to still grow a, a per, grow and develop a team or a team member. And that doesn't always need to mean that at some point down the road, they have to have direct reports. You can still grow and develop a team member in other ways. They can grow in scope of responsibility and skill set. They can grow in a lot of ways that isn't directly connected towards people. You could also find ways to help. Kind of, You know, I was probably somebody that 10 years ago would have been looked at as not a people manager, right? I told you that I was very driven by compliance and data and not necessarily connection. And uh, there are people that also you could help them develop that awareness, but you got to kind of identify that and help develop that plan for them and give them the tools and the resources on the front end. You don't want to just like throw them into the deep end of the water and see what happens because that impacts not just the the new manager, it's going to impact their team and ultimately all the other teams around them, right? So in yes, this cross-functional absolutely. world, we're all working with each other in some ways. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And you can turn. You, you know, don't take a great technician and turn them into a manager if they yeah. don't have the people stuff yet. Yes, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. People learn this stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's and and it's like having children. Yeah, yeah. It is. You you learn how to do it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, no one gave me a handbook. I did get the, you know, what to expect when you're expecting, but I didn't get a handbook. You have to kind of learn along, along the round, a little on the job training in that aspect for sure. A hundred percent. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Okay. All right. So um, uh, people are challenged out there, Megan, lots of challenges in the ways of our, in the way of our leaders and our managers. But here's the thing, the challenge, the obstacle is the way. So what common challenges do organizations face when trying to improve workplace culture? I'm curious about your answer to this, because this is what you and I are trying to do all, all day long, yeah. improve <laughs> workplace culture. So what do you think the challenges are and what should, what should they do to be more effective? Um, I think a lot of it comes from miscommunication in terms of, and so miscommunication turns into misalignment, right? Um, organization uh, are could always improve or look at ways to better create clarity in terms of mission and alignment and and focusing on bringing in teams that are really built and putting people, you know, in the the right roles on the right team, um, creating that kind of shared vision and alignment. So to me, I think that like one of the biggest challenges to really strong culture is that area that is like through miscommunication that kind of builds a little bit of mistrust. And ultimately, I think it's important for business leaders and organizations to understand that the decisions that we're making impact people in their lives. Right. And so. Oh, my gosh. Say that again. (laughs) Say that again. Yeah. Because we have this lifeline we're traveling. Another one of my favorite little models. And like work is like a big part of your life. Yes. And that's yeah. why people get sour on these companies is they're like, yes. I don't want to live like this. Yeah. yeah. So you you are at 
your office, you know, engaging with your coworkers, engaging with your team, you know, maybe more than you are during the work week than you are with your family. Yeah, exactly. And and that is a very that's a very common life experience, I think, for a lot of people. And so ultimately, you know, what what we want is we want to feel connected to that workplace. We want to feel connected to our team. We want to feel connected to the mission. And we have to understand what that mission is. We have to understand, you know, what the objectives are. And we have to understand the people that we're working with and what our role is within that kind of matrix, right? And so I think really focusing on clarity of mission, building like human connection, especially in, you know, today's hybrid, diverse kind of workplace um, where we have so many people that are in different areas. Uh, part of our team definitely works like hybrid and remote schedules. And so you don't have the same kind of natural, organic opportunities to engage in right. the proverbial and, water cooler. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, you know, I, I've heard a lot of feedback and and that was kind of like, we're going to all get together and and sit on, you know, a Zoom call together and that's going to help us build our culture. Sometimes doesn't always feel working. It doesn't feel, you know, authentic, I guess is what I should say to the team. And so if that's the case, what are we, how are we doing that? How are we managing it? Let's take a look at it. Let's see how we can actually build these connections in a more authentic and organic way. How can we focus on team members really understanding each other, supercharging that? Um, one of the unique things about Happy that we feel is like, once you take that assessment, you get that work style, it gives you this information within 10 minutes. And so it's a really easy way to kind of bring somebody on board and have them have access to information on their team right away. So using tools like that, where you can help teams better understand each other, provide those insights to help navigate the changes and the challenges with communication. Um, because the last thing you want is for a feeling to kind of settle and then it festers and then you're starting to build resentment and disengagement, right? And disengagement 100%. is the, you know, that is the end of a vibrant culture. So we have to continue to find ways to like push past that intentionally and provide these tools and resources, you know, from a leadership aspect. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, um, and I, and I love what you said, you know, it may not feel authentic to do that Zoom call. Um, and that's true. Uh, you know, a lot of leaders are, you know, like back to when we were talking about coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, having the one-on-ones is a big part of trust building. So um, people are like, well, what do we say? What do we do? Mm -hmm. um, and see, if you would Google what to do on a Zoom call for your yeah. team, you, you would get like 48 things yeah. that you could do on a Zoom call. Ways um, to get but, people talking and having like, you know, more engaged conversations. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and really what it takes is a leader who's brave enough to push past inauthenticity. Uh, in is that a word? Inauthenticity. Until we get to authenticity, yes, right? So yeah. there's always going to be like this little weird space, 100%. you know. And I, and I think you just got to navigate the weird space, and then yes. one day people are like, "Let's get on a Zoom call," yeah, you know, and they're excited. I mean, yeah. it will happen, yeah. but it won't happen. It will not happen if the leader doesn't want it to happen. Will it to happen? You know, all those, all those things. Yeah. So I, I want to say something about Zoom calls just real quick. So here, here's an idea for all of you listening. So uh, back during COVID, uh, nobody wanted to get in a room and do training. And so I have a lovely, lovely colleague named Amy Wortham. She gives me a call. She's like, how would you like to do SAP training, which is very technical German mm -hmm. enterprise software training. <laughs> and so, you know, I signed up and I had a lovely time. Uh, but one of the things that Duke Energy did, they were the customer, Duke Energy, which is a huge company out here, Megan, I'm sure it's like California Power. What's, <laughs> what's, your, what's, your, what's your big power company out there in California? We have uh, SoCal people. Edison. <laughs> okay. All right. So it's probably maybe not even as big as that, but it's like in five or six states. So long story short, we got this box in the mail and it said, do not open till Friday at four o'clock. And so what does everybody want to do? They want to open up this box, but like, we're all holding each other account. Don't you open your box. I'm not opening <laughs> my box. So, you know, so we're doing all this. Love so, that. Yeah. yeah. So this box comes, right. And it's very big. It's just, you know, yay big. And so it comes. And so finally we all get on a zoom. Please don't miss this. Everybody. We all get on a zoom, like all a hundred of us get on a zoom. And, uh, 
And then we have this like, it's time to unwrap your box. And so we unwrap our box and what's in the box, but like gourmet chocolates. And like this one's got this fancy cayenne pepper. What You know, I was just all this crazy stuff. And this one has a sesame seed, Japanese, whatever, whatever, soy sauce. And we were like, what is happening? And, and then they hired this guy uh, to get on and teach us how to taste chocolate. Oh, I and, love that. Oh, the and anticipation so, and just getting everybody excited about it. I was like writing it down because I think that's such a fun idea to do something like that. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and it was just, like the whole program was like a year long and like they did like, <laughs> they did like two or three things like that. But I'm still talking about all three of them. So yeah, I'm just, just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying it cost him a pretty penny to send us this chocolate, but <laughs> it created so much energy in the group right and and energy is vibrancy energy is happiness right you know mm -hmm. so i think that's really important yeah. all right got another okay. i got another question for you miss megan so okay how important you've you've talked about this a little bit but connection so i want you to maybe t dive into connection a little bit um well how important is connection in the workplace and what strategies can we do to connect people yeah i think i think connection is really that like bottom layer, the building layer for these relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And and in my opinion, relationships, again, are the, one of the most important aspects for building a strong culture because we're, we have to learn how to work effectively together. We have to better understand each other. And um, being able to like make those connections with other people um, and, you know, create space for that and to intentionally go through a process of trying to understand the other members of our team and help them to understand us is really important as part of that connection. Um, I do think that there's a lot of value to like aspects of team building. So the things that you were talking about, 100%, um, that's the kind of stuff that I love. You know what I mean? Me and it's really, really fun to see um, within teams. I, I think that um, when it's possible for teams to create connectivity, uh, you know, together, physically together, that's awesome and, and wonderful. It's not always possible. And I understand there's some teams that work completely remotely. Uh, but if you have hybrid teams or you do have in-office teams and you can create a space where um, you're able to enjoy each other's time and learn about each other, you know, outside of just roles and responsibility and to-do lists and things like that. So kind of intentionally creating a space that could be something as simple as company lunch or going on a walk or a hike together or something along those lines. It doesn't have to be connected towards like a bunch of expense, um, but being intentional about it. So put it on the calendar. Make sure that your team is exactly. creating a planned intentional space for this. Have, you know, a, a couple people or a person that's in charge of creating, you know, just quick ways for you to put that intention together. A business leader might look at that as time wasted. I look at that as time invested. That is mm. that time that you're going to be spending together, building those connections, understanding your relationships with each other, learning about people as, you know, the human aspect of them outside of the workplace is going to pay back tenfold. I now understand a member of my team, you know, has three small kids and her mornings are a little hectic. And maybe I can understand to provide a little bit more grace if she pops in a little bit later in the day than I had anticipated or if something unexpected comes up because I have the context, you know what I mean? The context of, of understanding what that is. And um, in the places where you're not able to have that like physical interaction, it doesn't mean that you still can't be intentional in terms of the way that we're communicating and talking to each other. So the same way you would plan that company outing, you know, to the park, plan it, put it on the calendar, create those meaningful one-on-one -on -one conversation, do the work to really learn about your team, learn the things that they need from you, learn the things that, you know, you talked about like energy, right? And I yes, like I always energy. come back to that as well. So I think that's such a powerful message. Mm -hmm. Different people get energy from different experiences, right? And so understanding what is it on my team that's going to boost someone's battery and what's draining their battery. And when their battery, I know their battery is drained because they're doing something that's challenging for them or maybe forces them to get uncomfortable or it forces them to like work outside of 
their regular behavioral style. I know that that's going to drain their battery. So it's my job as leader. How can I reconnect it? How can I help them recharge it? Um, so really like that comes down to that understanding and providing that intentional work of, of I think something that you spoke to earlier, of really helping people understand that they can, that they're supported um, and that you, you know, you're putting in the effort to, to recognize them as a fully developed human being with a, with a full and vibrant life, you know, and they'll bring that vibrant energy back into your work culture as well. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. And so um, in terms of connections, I've got a couple of ideas for you that I have witnessed because um, Megan is like, it's connection, connection, connection. She couldn't be <laughs> any more <laughs> correct. Um, so um, one thing that I was introduced to uh, kind of at an in-between place in my career. So uh, Megan, in my past, I, I did the restaurant thing. I did the apartment management, property management thing. And then I did the raise your baby thing. Yeah. Um, which was such a blessing for eight years. Yeah. Um, but my husband will say I quit and got three jobs the next day, which is probably <laughs> true. But anyway, I worked at the Y and I started raising money for charity and, you know, whatever. I mean, because I, I don't sit around very well. Yeah. But then in my little transition uh, back into the work world, when I started uh, Build a Vibrant Culture, I worked with this guy named Lance Armstrong. And, and so uh, he was the broker, not the biker. So he was in real estate. I love that. Name. That's a great yeah. tagline. No, and he had it on his business cards yeah. and everywhere. Yeah. He, what a that. fantastic, what a fantastic guy. But he had these lunch and learns and like every, you know, every week he would put us in a room and we would read a book on sales or customer service or real estate or whatever, um, or whatever the latest and greatest thing yeah. that was that he was interested in. And, you know, people, you might think our people don't want to read a book. We all had so much fun reading yes. these books and teaching ourselves. So there's the first thing. Do what Lance Armstrong, the biker, the, broker, <laughs> not the biker would do. Here's another uh, fun thing. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, TV station. It's called Inspiration Network. It's in North Carolina. It's in South Carolina, technically. Uh, but right on the North Carolina, South Carolina, Charlotte border. And when people get hired, they get a Fitbit. Oh. And... They have beautiful grounds. I mean, like beautiful sidewalks and trees and flower beds. And it is the most gorgeous place you've ever seen. And so one of their cultural things is, is let's go take a walk. I love that. And then there's this whole thing about like, okay, maybe How many got steps? 17,000 <laughs> steps. I'm going for a walk. You know what I mean? And so yeah. it's not like people are constantly walking, but like, if I need to talk to Megan about a project, I can go on a, you know, a 1000 step talk walk yeah. with her and yeah, the nice that. thing the last thing i'll say about this another idea for you um is uh, when i was in the property management business uh, i worked for this company called summit which is now camden properties and i will never forget ray jones was one of the owners and he calls me up and he's like nicole i'm coming to your property on thursday i'm taking you to lunch and i was like what and i mean i was like this is ray jones this is a big deal <laughs> and he just like took me for a sandwich and he's like, I just want to tell you, thank you. And so like the skip oh, level I love thing, that. Mm -hmm. it's huge. Like yes. he didn't tell me anything to do. We didn't walk the property. He didn't investigate anything. He didn't talk to me about why this number was that number or any of that mess. He's just like, I'm buying you a sandwich. Where do you want to go? And I'm like, let's go to Panera. You know, let's go to Panera. So I, and that was great. That just lived with me for, yeah. it's living with me still. Please don't miss that, everybody. 20 yes. years ago, yeah. still living with I me. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are all so, great. Those are, and what's great is they, those are those opportunities to create that authenticity that we were talking about, right? right? Like that was an authentic experience. You walked away knowing it, there wasn't a gimmick to it. It didn't feel like weird to you. He just wanted to thank you, have a moment, build a connection. I love that. And who doesn't like free lunch? Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, here's the other thing, Megan. There's there's all these things in HR world, like the trends that are out there. We got a lot mm -hmm. of trends going on out there. And they're shaping the future of human resources um, and workplace culture. How do you see the role of technology? She dropped the AI bomb just a few minutes ago. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit about the trends and technology and AI. What do you see happening out there? Yeah, I, I come from a place of feeling very excited about a lot of the shifts that we're seeing and the and the technology changes mm -hmm. that we're seeing. 
um, because and and I know that AI, especially in the HR space, people have you know a lot of feelings about it, and they're not quite sure exactly how they want to approach it. Um, their fears that you know AI is going to replace uh, mm -hmm. workers and displace jobs. And my position is that when used, you know, when used appropriately and when used responsibly, that should never happen because AI is great at helping make life a little bit easier, right? But it's never going to replace a human being. So yeah. at Happy, we do use generative AI to help us create some of the coaching content. That content then goes to expert coaches who curate it, who look through it, because it's very helpful to like get that starting point. But human beings are really the ones that have the expertise and the specialty. And so I think businesses, to be able to effectively tap into that resource, need to do it in a responsible way and need to understand that, that like, how could I utilize this tool to make space and make it easier and better down the road, you know, by automating things, making um, an aspect of someone's job easier because there's maybe some just routine work that they had to do that now we can automate through um, a certain technological tool. Well, guess what? Now that person has a bunch of brain space and a bunch of time that they get to put into being creative and innovative and building your business and feeling more connected to their work. And so in a lot of ways, I think that it's a very exciting time in human resources because these types of technologies, it's almost like uh, my opinion might be counter to what some people think, but I think that they actually will increase the, the center of leadership more towards that people-centric leadership focus because now we are creating systems that allow us to operate, you know, a little bit more effectively, perhaps a little bit more quickly. And great, what do I get to do? I get to really put time into thinking through how I'm creating mission alignment. You know, I'm I'm less worried about automating my payroll processes and I get to put more time into my one-on-ones with my team every day, which ultimately mm, that you know, those types of conversations should be the number one goal and the number one, you know, um, task that's on hand for managers and leaders. But oftentimes we get stuck in the routine. We get stuck in the work, you know, itself. And so I like to look at it as how can we take this technology and create um, an opportunity to really push it towards space for people leadership, space for connection, helping people feel more excited and engaged in their work by allowing them to focus on the things that fulfill them, that fill their cup, that charge that battery that we were talking about, right? So um, that's kind of the place that I, I like to look at it. I have, I, I'm trying to, um, you know, think of it really in terms of an optimistic mindset because I, I really don't see any place where these types of technologies, specifically AR, it's never going to replace, you know, a human being. A, we have amazing AI enhanced coaching that provides insights. That's not going to replace a human coach, but human coaches aren't available to everybody. So how can we utilize it to like create these effective, you know, supercharged kind of enhanced conversations, but also understanding if there's, you know, there's a whole new other world out there that's never going to go away. And this is meant to kind of improve upon and make life better, in my opinion. Um, and so that's the place that, I, that I'm that i really operating from is that I'm very excited about where this kind of technology and HR um, is moving. Yeah, I, I see AI as kind of like the cherry on the top. You got to have a solid, <laughs> you got to have a solid yes. human connection. You got to have a solid understanding with the people you work with. Yeah. And then if AI can like be the sprinkles or the cherry, that's um, it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, I'm trying, I'm racking my brain to think of this guy's name. And I cannot think of his name, but I, he wrote an article. I read it the other day. And so I'll try to find it and put it in the show notes. But he, he said, uh, he had this article and he said, AI is great, but you know what it's missing? Experience and stories. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and that's yeah. the human condition right there yeah. is that we, we are built on stories, built on experience. And so it's just an accompaniment, you know, it's just oh, the sour cream on your baked potato. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yes. I'm hungry. Can you tell? Okay. All right. Very good. All right. So um, what, uh, here, oh my gosh, it's the top of the hour. I can't believe we've already spent all this time together, uh, but it's been so great to hang out with Megan with Happy Companies. Um, so what core message or takeaway? I know my listeners are like, wait, 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 Megan, ask her <laughs> questions. So I'm going to let you freestyle here. 
what core message or takeaway would you like listeners to gain from your experiences and the work that you've been doing? So like give them a final major nugget here, Megan. Got it. Okay. So I would say there's two things that I always okay. try to two get my team to think about. The first is that um, as long as you're safe, it's okay to be uncomfortable, right? So in workplace relationships, sometimes we have to get uncomfortable. That's where the growth is. And that's mm-hmm. part of that like self-discovery, self-reflection, adapting outside of our natural style. So um, I had to get real uncomfortable outside of my kind of natural, more introverted tendencies. I probably would never imagine I'd be on a podcast or something 10 years ago, right? Because she's a natural image. So putting in that kind of, again, intentional work toward sitting in the discomfort, and then it starts to feel a little bit more comfortable and you start to like build, build that confidence. So as long as you're safe, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. And then um, I always say, I think leaders are readers. So, you know, oh my I, gosh. I really believe strongly in, um, you know, constantly learning from others. And the best way for me that I found to be able to take in the most knowledge from other uh, leaders and other experts or just other people's life experiences, regardless of what you're interested in, is reading. If you, you know, re- get the audiobooks, if you if that's more accessible to you, there's tons of ways to like get that information and distill that information. But never stop challenging yourself to learn more. I've spent many years trying to absorb information. I probably know about a thimble full out of the ocean's worth of great leadership oh, content know. that's out there, right? So um, that's another message that we always kind of try to distill down to the team is just leaders or readers. So continue to to challenge yourself to learn from others around you and and take bits and pieces, you know, and start to integrate them in to be able to kind of create your own your own leadership style. Yeah, yeah. And that just is right in there with my lunch and learn. So here he is. She's got a whole bookshelf behind her. Yeah. On YouTube. So what yeah. what are you reading? I, I'm going to give a couple plugs. So I'm reading this book right now by Oh, William I got to write that one down. Actualized, Actualized Teamwork. teamwork. Oh. So do you know, everybody knows Maslow, right? The hierarchy. Yes. Needs yeah. Self-actualization. So it's like how to have a self-actualized team. Um, so I love Dr. Sparks. Um, and then I'm also, I'm a big fan of all of Gino Wickman's work. And so right now I'm reading Rocket Fuel. That's a great, that's it. Yeah. There's so- yeah. Is it on the shelf? Okay, good. Yes. Right. So, yeah. so both Megan and I are, are reading it. You should read <laughs> yeah. the Rocket Fuel, everybody. Okay. Um, all right. What are you reading? So I just went through a big, like, month-long spree of reading every Patrick Lencioni book that I possibly Oh, could. and Jimmy, <laughs> love him. Yeah. So I have been, uh, like, I've read through, I think, about four or five of them. Um, We're really working on um, kind of creating some intentional culture building, you know, and so trying to, like, create um, systems for our teams. And I I really connected with those books. So I would say, honestly, anything that I've read by him is great. And then just to show you that I do um, keep it on my, I do listen to audiobooks, too. So right now I'm also listening to Work Rules, um, which is, yeah. Laszlo Bach, um, what, what it's about kind of like the Google approach towards, um, you know, people centric leadership and managing performance and things like that. So, yeah. 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 And I, and here's the thing about these books, right? Is you might get, well, if you take notes and you underline and highlight and review, you might get 27 nuggets out of a book. Yeah. But, but if you get, if you get just like one stinking mm-hmm. nugget, Yes. It's like worth everything. And so um, I'm going to do one more shout out because um, I'm nerding out on the book thing because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a voracious leader. Like when I was yeah, a kid, too, that's all yeah. I did was go to the library. Um, <laughs> Seth, so uh, another guy that you need to be reading is John Maxwell. And so, you know, yeah. all this whole time, um, Megan Cook, co-founder of Happy Companies, has been telling us uh, it's relationship people. It's people centric people, 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 people. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he's got this book called The Five Levels of Leadership. And I, I I, teach it all the time. Like I go in and teach it to new managers and existing managers because, again, they didn't get the proper training that they needed to handle people. But yeah. in these five levels, the second level is relationship. Yeah. And, you know, so as she's talking about this, as you read all these other books, you'll see that like while there's nothing new under the sun hello that you know if you want your people to be happy you want to have a happy company you're going to have to do relationship and connection and 
Gosh, I'm so grateful Man. that Megan could <laughs> come out with me this morning. So great to have you on the Build a Vibrant it's Culture been podcast. It's just a joy. I really enjoyed our time chatting. Yeah. It was just a pleasure to talk to you. You too. Okay, so where do people find you? Give us all the links and the websites and the <laughs> all stuff. The Give us stuff. all the stuff. Yeah. yeah. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn, but um, most importantly, I would say check out Happy Companies. So happycompanies.com. Um, it's spelled just like it sounds. And um, you can learn all about, you know, the amazing platform and uh, sign up for a demo, sign up for a free trial. Um, there is a free trial available. So anybody that's interested should definitely go um, check it out because it's really powerful. It wouldn't cost you anything. You could pop right on, take your assessment, get that happy work style. Um, and, you know, and then you're right in your workspace and able to kind of like distill it down from there. So definitely encourage everyone to take a look. Okay, that's fantastic. All right, everybody, that's been another episode of the Build a Vibrant Culture podcast. Here's what we have to do, though. Before we go, could you please just simply go and click like, do the little thumbs up for <laughs> Megan and I. And if you would leave a little comment, you know, like, I think Megan is amazing or whatever you want to put on there, uh, show us some love. You know, we would appreciate that so much. And if you would go over to LinkedIn, find Megan, Megan Cook, co-founder of Happy Companies, and then Nicole Greer, Build a Vibrant Culture. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week with another episode of the Build a Vibrant Culture podcast. All right, see you later, Megan. Thank you so much. Have a great day.